recommend. Hands up. Who here loves to celebrate? Celebrate, yeah? I would sing this song, you know, celebrate. Da, 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 da. Anyway. Um, but I won't sing for you. Not today. Another day. Um, celebrations are something that I believe a majority of people enjoy. Now, the issue when it comes to celebrating is not that we enjoy celebrating or don't. It's actually how we choose to celebrate. Some of us, the perfect celebration is to have a big event with lots of people and fireworks and cake and laughter and you want to start at 7 p.m. because you don't want to finish until 4 a.m. For some of us, that's like, that's how you celebrate. For some of us, celebrating is much better if it's just you and two or three really close friends away from everybody else so you can just enjoy their company. And for a few of us, if there can be no one else in the room with our choice of food, our choice of television program or a movie or maybe a book or maybe just sitting out somewhere with a beautiful scenic view and, uh, and the world is just not even there. Maybe that for you is what a good celebrating or a good celebration looks like. We all like celebrating, but we all want to celebrate differently. And how we celebrate actually says a lot about the community that we are a part of. How we choose to celebrate says a lot about the community that we are and it actually shapes us. It shapes us. There are two parts of celebrating that really shape us uh, in whatever it is you're gathering as. So for us as a church, how we choose to celebrate, and more importantly, actually, what we choose to celebrate, shapes how we act as a community. And the thing I want to look at this morning is because we are a faith-based community who believe in God and we believe uh, that He has a plan for us and that we should be living our lives according to that plan, uh, it should be a question that we ask is, well, what does God celebrate and how can we join in what He chooses to celebrate? And if you've got your Bible, I want you to go through to Luke chapter 15 because I think this, uh, these three stories that Jesus tells, these three parables, give us an insight into what it is that God celebrates. It doesn't tell us necessarily fully how to celebrate other than the fact that it's a guarantee there is going to be food. Celebration always involves food. It's just we love food. Isn't it funny that uh, we need it to live? God made us with this thing of, oh, you have to eat all the time, otherwise things don't go well. And then he's like, and when you want to really celebrate, get lots of food or a certain type of food. It's just interesting how God set the place up. He just, huh? Very, ah, yeah, very thoughtful. Yeah, he's very thoughtful, which is awesome uh, because we all love food. So Luke chapter 15, we have these three stories about what it is that God chooses to celebrate. So to set the scene here so you understand what's happening, Jesus is telling some stories. And if you look there in the uh, first couple of verses, it sets up who he's talking to and what he's talking about. So Luke 15, I'll read it out here. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. So Jesus is walking around and he has a message which is so engaging that the people who uh, as the religious establishment saw as unsavory or as people who lived outside of what God would consider how it is we should live, he had a message that was so captivating that people who were sinners and tax collectors, I love that tax collectors get their own little, you know, they're not included in there, obviously they're not great people, um, they wanted to come and hear Jesus speak. Which is just amazing because Jesus uh, was there to tell the Jews um, and tell his, because Jesus was a Jew himself, he was there to go and fulfill prophecy and go to the religious establishment. But as he was going around with his message, people who were nothing like Jesus wanted to come and hear what Jesus had to say. Which should tell you something about his message, that it was very engaging and that it is something that they wanted to hear. But the problem is that as he attracted all of these people, the Religious leaders of the day were not very happy with this. And it goes on in verse 2. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered. I love it. They muttered to each other. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And Luke records for us, then Jesus told them this parable. So it's great. So Jesus is there. The religious leaders are looking and saying, these people don't belong in this religious system that Jesus is a part of. And yet he's welcoming them in. That's not how this works. God wants us to be separate. God wants us to be a people who are, who are apart from those who live a certain lifestyle or live a certain way. And Jesus is there as a leader representing this movement. 
And he is attracting these people and he's eating with them. He's actually sharing his, his food with people who aren't of the same hierarchy or aren't of the same order that he is. And so they're muttering to themselves, doesn't he know who these people are? How can he eat with them? And Jesus hears them and so he tells them these three stories. And here it is that we have these three great parables. Now these parables uh, are stories that Jesus makes up or uses to make us think about our faith and makes them think about their faith to prove a point. Now as we go through these three, you might come to a different conclusion than I have. And that's absolutely fine. The parables are not something you read and they have one answer and then everyone goes and copies it. And in fact, one of the sad things sometimes is that we think parables are just for children and we give them to Sunday school and then we never touch them again when we're in adult church because we've got to look at other stuff that's more important. But parables are something that Jesus says to most of the time actually point out the injustice in the world and there's no one answer that comes from it. It's to get us to think about how it is that we live out our faith. So here we have three parables, and I want to go through them quickly together and then try to apply it to where we are in our lives. So the first parable is this. It's the parable of the lost sheep. So Jesus has heard what they're saying. How can he eat with these people who are nothing like us? The Pharisees are going on saying, Jesus, doesn't he know better? Those are not the people that you and I associate with. And Jesus says, imagine you had 100 sheep. Now for me, if I had 100 sheep, I would be very in trouble. I don't know what to do with 100 sheep. They're not all going to fit on my property. Uh, They're going to run on the road. Anyway, so suppose you had 100 sheep and one of them went missing. Would you not stop and go and look for that one lost sheep to bring it back home? Now, if it was me and I had one out of 100 missing, 99% ain't bad. That's pretty good. I'm pretty sure if memory serves me correct, if I got over 50% in school, I was happy. If I had over 50 sheep... I think I would have been fine. But the point that Jesus is making here is that when this one goes missing, this one sheep goes missing, a good shepherd, not a bad shepherd, a bad shepherd would just go, well, I've got enough, we can keep going. A good shepherd stops, puts the 99 under the care of someone who can look after them and goes off in search for that one lost sheep. And then this is what I love. He goes, he gets the sheep, And he brings the sheep back. And then if you look down here in verse 6, he goes home, he calls his friends and neighbors together, and he says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. This man who goes and search for what is lost finds it and doesn't just go and put it back with the other 99 and says, bad sheep, don't do that again. He goes, he returns the sheep, and then he goes and he calls in his friends and says, come and celebrate with me. Come and celebrate. That which was once lost, I I found it again. Come and let's celebrate this good news. So that's the first parable that Jesus tells. Then he says another one because he really wants to hit this point and get this point going home. Or suppose a woman has 10 coins, 10 silver coins, and she loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she does, she calls in her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. And I love verse 10. In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels, in the angels of God, over one sinner who repents. Now at this point, it's a little bit abstract. Suppose you had a hundred sheep. Say there was a lady who had 10 silver coins. Like You might be thinking, okay, I I get the point that's happening there. But Jesus wants to take it from something which is abstract and he wants to give us a story which we can find that we relate to a little bit more. And as we look at this story, there's actually two positions. And if you're familiar with Tim Keller, he does a great series called The Prodigal Son. Um, And I encourage you, if you've never looked into that before, uh, have a look at that. But in this next story... He wants to tell it, and there's two positions you can take within the story. There's the younger son, and there's the older son. And we're going to go through, and then we'll bring it together at the end as to how we approach, how we approach this parable. So Jesus continues, all right, sheep, coins, let's have a look at people. Let's have a look at what really matters. Let's have a look at people. So Jesus continued, verse 11. There was once a man who had two sons. The younger son wasn't exactly happy with what it was that he had, the way that they chose to live. 
He wanted his own control. He wanted to live life his own way. But the problem is that this youngest son, he was trapped because he didn't have access to any wealth. He lived in the house and the father had a lot of wealth and a lot of servants. But the, the son had to live under his father's rule. So the son had an idea and he thought to himself, well, if I can get access to some wealth, then I can go off on my own and I can live life the way that I want to live it. I don't have to live by the rules of my father. So he approaches his father. And in a very, for us, he goes up and he says he wants his inheritance now. Contextually, he was going up to say, Dad, it's actually better if you're dead because I have the money. Whereas you're alive, I don't have the money. So can you give me the money? And uh, that would be awesome. Now, I don't, it doesn't tell us how that conversation went, but that would be a very awkward conversation, wouldn't it? Uh, you're worth more to me dead than alive. That's a very tough one. Anyway, so he goes up and the father, for some reason, like the father had every right to say, no, and I'm unsure if this is true, but to me, if I was a father, I'd start to relook at my will obligations at this point. That servant who's a little bit more respectful, maybe he can have your money. Anyway, um, <laughs> but the father says, you know what? I'll give you what you ask. I'll give you what you ask. And at this point, I can imagine the older son looking at this like, what are you doing? What are you doing, brother? Like you're being a little bit fool, very foolish. You're choosing to do something which which is just unwise. But the younger brother says, nope, thank you very much, I'll take the money. So the younger brother, now emancipated from his family, has an opportunity and a lot of wealth to go and carve out the life that he really actually wanted to live. And so this young son went out on the road and he lived it up, man, like he partied hard. He partied hard. And you know what? When you have a lot of money and you party hard, you can get a lot of friends. But the problem is that after partying for a while and spending the money on food, parties, women, on all sorts of different things, uh, the money ran out. And when the friends who came because you had a lot of money, uh, when the money runs out, they, they run away for some strange reason, odd. And they obviously went on to the next person who had a lot of money. And now this son is sitting there going, I have no money. I have no friends. I had a heck of a high, but now I'm at a very big low. And to make ends meet, this young son has to go and do something which is really disgraceful. He has to go and get a job. And there's not many jobs going. And the job he ends up doing is feeding pigs, which is very, very tough. And he's sitting there one day and he's feeding these pigs this slop. And he's so hungry that he thinks to himself, maybe I should have a little bit of that food just to help me get by. And at that point, for some reason, a thought comes to his head. What am I doing here? What am I doing here in this position? The servants at my father's house, they're looked after. They're well fed. They have purpose. They have a job which is good. And I'm sitting here and I'm worse than the servants in my, parent, in my father's own house. So he thinks to himself, to get out of this predicament that I'm in, maybe I should go back to my dad. And I should go and ask and make a proposal and ask if I can come back and be a servant because at least then I'm going to get looked after because at the moment, I'm not getting looked after. And so the son takes off. And I just imagine him walking along trying to think of how is this conversation going to go. Like, okay, I should fall to my knees. I should beg. Uh, maybe I can bring up how much of a hard worker I am. Maybe I can uh, use him as my reference to get a job. I don't know. He's going along and he's thinking to himself, how am I going to convince my dad to take me back? Because when I left, it was a pretty big slap in the face. And as he's walking back home, as he's thinking through what is it that I'm going to say, his father starts running towards him. So as the son is off in the distance, the dad is sitting there, I don't know, maybe he's on a porch on a rocking chair and he's just looking out on the world. And he sees his son in the distance. And he does something which is very, very uncharacteristic. He, he runs. And men at that time in that society did not run. It was undignified to run. You walked. Where you went is where time went. You didn't run and operate to another person's schedule. He was the head of the house. But he chose in that moment to run, to go and embrace his son. And he takes off. And can you imagine the son's surprise? Because he's expecting to come up to the house to like plead to get in, to get FaceTime with his father and then plead his case and say, can I please come back? Can I come back and serve you? But what he's met with instead as he goes up to the house is his father running towards him and embracing him. Embracing him, loving him, hugging him. 
And then this is a, the, the coolest part of the story is he doesn't even take the offer. He doesn't, you're not going to be my servant. He restores him to full sonship, to full sonship. He had every right to treat that son in any way that he wanted to. This son was coming back in a moment of weakness after offending the household, after partying it up, after blowing all the cash. He didn't even come back with any of the cash. Imagine if he at least come back with like most of the money. He could have sort of made a case like, I went away, I used your money, but here's most of it back. That would have been a better case than it's gone. But he's rocking up there and he, it's gone. But the father doesn't chastise him. He embraces him. He welcomes him back in and he restores him to full sonship. And he celebrates and he tells everyone, come, we must celebrate. My son, which is lost, is now found. Kill the fattened calf. So kill um, the calf, which has a lot of meat on it because we want to celebrate. This is, don't get the skinny ones. This is a celebration time. We're not just going to get out and get out a little salad to the side. No, let's get some meat. Let's get together. Let's get it all. Let's party it up. And that's the story of the younger son. He offended his father. He spent all of the inheritance. He lived a life which was outside of what his father wanted for him. But when he came back to be in his father's presence again, he was embraced and restored to full sonship. That's an incredible story that Jesus tells. But there is the older brother. And we only hear about him here at the end. The older brother, verse 28, became angry. And he refused to go into the party. So his father went out and pleaded with him. Another very uncharacter. This father is a very loving father because he could have stayed in there and said, son, you will come to me. But his older, the older brother sees the party going on. Like, what is this? Why are we celebrating this? Uh, my brother who's an idiot who went out there and did stupid things. Why are we celebrating this? And he's standing outside of the party and the father hears that the older brother's outside the tent and he could have said, get in here, boy. Come. But he doesn't. He goes out to meet with the older brother and he says to him, please come inside the party. Come be a part of what's going on. What is lost is now found. My son who went away is now restored to me properly and we are now becoming a family again. Can you please just come inside? Because I want to celebrate this moment with both of you. But he answered his father, verse 29. Look, all these years I've been slaving for you And I never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, I love that, he doesn't say my brother, when this son of yours, he's removing himself from him, but when this son of yours has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill a fattened calf for him. I was with you the whole time. I worked the way that you said that I should work. I was here. And he's the one who left. He's the one who took the money. He's the one who went and spent it on women and partying. And now he comes back and he's the one who gets to be celebrated. That's not fair. And the father looks at him lovingly and says this. My son, you're always with me and everything that I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad. I love that. We had to be glad. Because this brother of yours that was dead is alive again. He was lost. And now he is found. Two brothers and two completely different perspectives. This story of the prodigal son culminates in a celebration. But the question that is raised from it is, what does it actually look like to be Lost, or what does it actually look like to be far from our Heavenly Father? If you're listening to that story or embracing that story for the first time, and especially for the people in the Jewish context who would have heard Jesus say this, the answer to who is lost is abundantly clear. The son who disobeyed, who was reckless, and who was far from where the Father was and what the Father wanted, he is the one who is disobedient, he is the one who has no part in the Father's household anymore. And I can imagine the people listening to Jesus would be nodding up until a point. They'd be like, yeah, we get this. We understand this. Disobedient children, bad. We understand, yep. But then the story turns to celebration. I can imagine them start to get a little bit confused as 
for some of us, we've read this many times, we know the answer. When you know the answer or the ending, it sort of blows the story. But when you're reading this for the first time, it can be confusing. Because God, or the Father in this case, who, who um, Jesus is saying God is the Father in this, God is celebrating this person and their reckless behavior. What's going on here? So if you're reading it for the first time, the son who leaves, he's the disobedient one. He's the lost one. He's the one who needs redemption. And the father redeems him. The father actually restores him to full sonship. But then this little bit at the end, because remember at the beginning, the Pharisees are asking, how can you eat with sinners? How can you eat with tax collectors? How can you be with these people who are so far from you? At the end here, Jesus adds something for those of us. And for those at the time who call ourselves religious. It is possible to be with God, to obey what he says, and to be unable to take part in his plan for this world. The Pharisees are looking at Jesus. They're seeing him do something which he shouldn't be doing. He should not be eating with those people. He should not be associating with those people. And Jesus tells them this story and says, you can be obeying God to the nth degree, but if you miss out on loving and celebrating with what God celebrates and with who God loves, then you're going to miss being a part of God's plan. And it hurts my heart, and I'm sure it hurts many people in this room. There are are religious people. There are people who say that they believe in God, who question or who at times have sat and seen people respond to God for the first time or or say they believe in Jesus, but get hung up on the details of their life. How can that person say that they want to know Jesus? Don't they know, don't people know their addiction they're going through? Don't they know their sexual preference? Don't they know the way they handle themselves at home? Don't they know the way they handle alcohol? Look, Look at that person's life. It does not look the way that it should. And when people decide to turn to God and say, I don't want to live the life I have and I want to turn towards Jesus, it's messy. It's gloriously messy, actually. Because when, when you come to God and when you came to God for the first time in your life, the chances are is that all those sinful behaviors and all those things that are a part of us, all those negative aspects that don't reflect God and His glory, they weren't zapped away, were they? Or were they? Were they? Otherwise, I'm getting the raw end of the deal here. When we decide to follow Jesus, when we turn towards our Heavenly Father and want to be restored in relationship to Him, life does not go from, oh, I was a bad person to, oh, wow, look at this. I don't do this anymore. I don't do that anymore. My smoking addiction's gone. My addiction to drugs, to pornography. Oh, the way I treat people is so much more loving. I'm such a loving person now. Before I was angry and people really teed me off, but now I'm just really loving. I, I like people. Everyone, everyone can have all of my stuff. I used to be really greedy, but now, look, here, take my car. That's fine. I don't care. Don't have a license? Don't worry. It's got four wheels. Go, go, go. Um, we don't suddenly, that'd be bad. Don't do that. Um, we don't just suddenly find God and go, wow, it's easy now to live the way that God has designed us to live. That doesn't happen. There are some things which miraculously God deals with, but then there's the rest of it which we have to keep dealing with until we finish our time on earth and get to go and be with our Heavenly Father for eternity. He'll deal with it eventually. He may not deal with it on this side, but He'll deal with it on the other side. And these Pharisees, they are literally missing the Son of God reaching out to the lost people who need God the most. And their, their judgment of that situation is, you shouldn't be doing that. Now, hindsight is twenty twenty. At the time, I honestly believe that those religious leaders were living out to the best of their knowledge what they expected to happen. I believe that they lived out going, well, if God was really to rock up here and now, he would be calling everybody to come back to Torah, to law, and to come back to what we know and to fall in line with the religious establishment. Because after all, if you look through the Old Testament, God has established an order for how his people relate to him. And now Jesus comes on the scene and he starts to relating to everybody with love and openness and acceptance. And he starts to go around and just be loving to those who fall outside of what it is that the religious people expect. 
So Jesus tells them this story. He tells them three stories. Uh, the first two are just primers. You get it. When a sheep goes missing, you go looking, you find sheep, yay. Coin gets lost, you go look for the coin, you find the coin, come on everybody, come. Celebrate with me, that which is lost is found. Then he comes to this story. A son disobeys a father, lives an unruly life, and then the father celebrates him coming back. Yay, but as they were hearing that, do you think they were thinking yay? They understood a lost sheep. They understood a lost coin, but then when it came to a lost son, would they have celebrated the return of the lost son? Or would they have said, he has to pay his dues, the father is right to exclude him, he doesn't deserve to be reconciled to full sonship. And so Jesus added that last little part about the older brother. And he's saying to those who are gathered around, don't be like the older brother. There is a new movement of God happening. I have come so that the world, the whole world can be restored to God the Father. And this new movement means that you're going to have to actually come and celebrate with people who you'd never imagine you'd be celebrating with. He was rocking up, teaching and expecting people who were Pharisees, people who were religious leaders. He was, he was expecting that they would come across and start to celebrate with what God's new movement on earth was. But they weren't ready or they, they, they just didn't respond the way that Jesus, or that they should have. They didn't see the signs. They didn't do what they should have done. And I'm not saying that, as I said before, it's not that they were necessarily always disobedient. They just didn't know any better. Jesus was doing something so new. He says something about you can't put new wine in old wineskins. It doesn't work. This new movement has started coming. This new thing is happening. And Jesus defines this new movement through, at the end of the day, his sacrificial love on a cross. He dies for all of the lost sons and daughters. He goes to the cross and he actually gives up the offering of himself so that everybody, no matter your past, no matter where you've been, what you've done, everybody who responds to the good news that Jesus is Lord of all, they can have life and be restored to their heavenly father. The trick is, in our context, to modernize it for us, for those of us who found Jesus a long time ago or for those of us who found him a while ago, the trick is that as God does a new movement through the new world that we're in, I want to just take a moment here to recognize the way that technology interacts with our life, the way that our society is restructuring itself in terms of uh, uh, how we think about the workplace, how we think about family. As the world restructures, God is still moving through this. His movement is still there, but it's going to look very different to how it used to look. And we as a church... And we as a faith community, locally and globally, especially in a Western context, when God is moving and people are turning to Him, we don't want to be stuck there going, but that's not how you do church. But that's not how you follow God. But that's not how a Jesus follower should behave. We don't want to be stuck out there looking and saying, that's not the correct answer. When people embrace the name of Jesus, when they believe in His resurrection, His death on the cross and in His resurrection, God will sort out all the other stuff. They might have some crazy thoughts at first. We all have crazy thoughts. We probably still have crazy thoughts about how the world should be structured now. Um, but God will work on them. The Holy Spirit will do His work through Scripture, through prayer, through community. And whatever it is that this next phase of life within the modern Australian context looks like for Christianity, uh, we want to be championing it, loving it, and wherever Jesus' name is raised, we want to celebrate that. Because while we look at this story and go, ha ha, Pharisees, didn't you see God was doing something new? Because that could be very tempting because we know what happened. We've got to check ourselves and make sure that we are not looking at this new movement of Christianity through the world in whatever context it may be, in whatever way it forms and presents itself. We don't want to be looking at that and going, but that's not how you follow God. Don't you know you go to church every Sunday? Don't you know that you give 10%, which is questionable from biblical perspective, but anyway, don't you know you do this, 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 and this, but the new way that we live out our faith with technology, with the way the world is now 24-7, you want to say have a rest day on Sunday, but you uh, have to work two jobs and one of your jobs is on a Sunday, that's reality. You want to say, well, this is the way that a relationship should look, 
um, and this is the way it should behave. And there's just different, there's different ways in our cultural context, things are behaving differently, but God is still moving in all of it. So there's an exciting edge to this, that Jesus, the same Jesus who came and blew these Pharisees away and said, hey, celebrate with me when that which is lost is now found. That same God is moving today. It just looks different to probably what you and I are used to. But we need to celebrate and we need to be happy and we need to champion wherever it is that the Holy Spirit is moving and wherever it is that people are coming back to follow Jesus. So what's the application for this morning? If you're someone who is looking for God and you're still trying to figure out whether Jesus is real or whatever this whole God situation is, I want you to know that I have faith and I have complete confidence from this parable that God is actively looking for you. I believe that God actively wants every person to become his child, to be restored to full sonship or daughtership. God wants everybody to turn to him. I, I believe that. So if you're sitting there this morning and you're still trying to figure this out, that's fine. God loves you and God wants you to know him. If you're here this morning and you do know God, then here's our application. One, we need to celebrate when someone decides to follow Jesus. Not that long ago, we got to see um, Nicole baptized. That was amazing. That was incredible. We got to see someone, and Nicole, she had a great journey coming to, see, coming to know Jesus, and we celebrated with her. Whenever somebody says that they want to know Jesus, whenever somebody says that they now believe in God and, they believe, and they're on a journey, we need to celebrate that. That is worth celebrating. How do we celebrate it? Have meals, uh, clap, applaud, hug them, love them. Uh, open up your life to them. But whenever someone says that they want to believe in God or someone says they want to follow Jesus, we need to be the first ones there saying, that's awesome. Now let's go on this journey together. And that leads to the second thing. We need to celebrate when someone follows Jesus and we need to open up our life to them. Because when someone says for the first time, hey, I want to know about Jesus and what this deal is, uh, don't just go, here, read this book of the Bible. What did you come up with? Bad way of doing it. When someone says they want to know God, read the Bible with them. Show them what a Christian life looks like, what a following Jesus in this context looks like. Because anyone who comes to something for the first time, they just need to be shown and they need to be loved, no matter what it is. If you go to sport for the first time, you don't just expect to rock up, get given a hockey stick, put on a field and then play not going to know what you're doing. Yeah, for some reason, uh, at times it's been okay to go, oh, you want to know about Jesus? Read this on your own, and then we'll talk. No, 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 no. Read with them. Listen to them. Talk with them. Love them. Show them how you read Bible. Show them how you handle your finances, your spouse, your family, your relationships. That way, there'll be a lot more, a lot more impact, and I have an opportunity to see what it is like to follow a Christian life. So imagine our world, and I'm going to close out with this. Imagine our world here at Les Murdy Baptist Church and in our surrounding community. Imagine our world if we had the opportunity to celebrate more and more people following Jesus. How awesome would that be? How many more parties would we get to throw? Once a year, for the last year I was here, last two years I've been here, at Christmas time, uh, we did a big Christmas thing. We had a whole community event out there. Um, the petting zoo came. That was awesome. Uh, for children and adults alike, I could see a couple of parents like, come, come. And then they wanted to pet the animal. That was using their kid completely as an excuse. I was one of them. Um, it was awesome. There was coffee van. There was so much happening out there. It was such a great celebration. And why do we celebrate at Christmas? Jesus. Right? That's awesome. Imagine if we can become a community where we're able to put up events like that and have that level of celebration. We don't need to have the petting farm, but if we do, I mean, it's pretty good. Yeah, petting zoo is awesome. Anyway, um, if we could have that level of celebration whenever it is that someone came to know Jesus for the first time, not just a nice applaud on a Sunday, not a nice, oh, I think I saw a video of your testimony. Imagine if every time someone turned to God, we actually celebrated and we really meant it. How amazing would that be? And that would shape our culture. Because I said at the beginning, how we celebrate and what we choose to celebrate really does shape the culture we have. If we want to celebrate having a nice Sunday morning service, 
if we want to celebrate getting you guys out on time so you can get your tea and coffee and go away, if we want to celebrate um, just making sure that the music sounds okay, if we want to celebrate that stuff, that's fine, but that's what will get the attention. But if we choose to celebrate and celebrate well when people come to know Jesus for the first time, then we're going to want to start to see that more and more. And we're going to want to see that be something which is a, a part of our culture and a part of our DNA. So my prayer for all of us is that we will embrace celebrating no matter what the new frontier of Christianity looks like. And Karen and I have stood up here and talked about that from time to time. Christianity doesn't look like people coming every Sunday. It doesn't look like them serving in a traditional way. And it doesn't look like them engaging in community in the way that we probably grew up with. I missed a Sunday service for the first time when I was sick uh, a month and a half ago. That was the weirdest Sunday of my life. I go to church every Sunday. Even when I'm on holidays, I love going to other people's churches and celebrating what they're celebrating. I love checking out what other churches are doing because it's just great to be able to go and see what God is doing in other spaces and places. And no, it's not just us up here trying to follow God to our ability. There are churches everywhere trying to see the name of Jesus glorified and see his justice go through this earth. But as we recognize that the way that we engage with Christianity has changed and is changing, we have pockets where it's how it used to be, but it is changing, I pray that we celebrate the new movement of God that's happening and that we are able to be a part of it in our workplace, in our family, with our friends, and as we embrace Scripture, prayer, and a life which is obedient to Jesus.